Uh, my name is Tom Miller. I have the honor and privilege of being the sixth director to the Chesapeake Biological Lab, the founding director of the, the founding laboratory of the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. And tonight we're presenting the last of our autumn series of science for the community lecture. Uh, for those of you who are joining us on Zoom, uh, a reminder that this is being run as a Zoom conference, so you will not be able to unmute. But if you have a question during this evening's presentation, uh, please feel free to type it into the chat box and we will work to um, answer questions that have been posted in the chat box at the end of the evening. Uh, for those who are here in the room, um, thank you all very much for coming. Uh, enjoy the popcorn and biscuits that have been kindly provided by our sponsors, who are Southern Maryland Toyota and Team Hyundai, um, who have been supporting this series for about five years now, and we greatly appreciate their, their support. Um, we hosted this series for well, for at least a decade, um, with the idea of telling the community who we are, what we do, and why it is important. And over the course of that decade, we've had a number of distinguished faculty from this institution and researchers from other institutions come and talk to you. Um, but I must admit, of all those presentations, I'm looking forward to tonight probably more than any of them. Just to put water on the spot. <laughs> Tonight's speaker is Dr. Walter Boynton, who is a, an emeritus professor here. For those of you who know Walter, you will know his links to this institution run particularly deep. He started as a postdoc uh, here in the early 1970s. Um, he was two at the time, I think, when he started. <laughs> uh, he then went to the University of uh, Florida, did his graduate work and came back here uh, and has stayed here throughout his academic career. The term gentleman and scholar is used, I think, too often in our field, but Walker epitomizes those two, two words. He is a scholar of his science, and he is quite simply one of the most decent men you will ever meet. I know that from first hand when I came here in 1994. Um, I was in the old Truett building, which I'm told by architects was a wonderful example of brutalist architecture, <laughs> which means it was ugly, it had no windows, and I was in the basement. <laughs> And I was there for two days before anyone came to find me. And the person who came to find me was Walter. Um, Walter is very much a part of this community. He strives to make us better and done, has done a great deal to make us better. His contributions are recognized scientifically. One of the papers he co-authored with long-term collaborator Mike Kemp on how to do synthesis in science is one of the most highly cited papers uh, in, a, in our field. He was recognized by Governor O'Malley as an admiral of the Chesapeake Bay, and he won the Matthias Medal from Maryland Sea Grant, which is given very rarely for contributions to science. He epitomizes what this institution does. It does actionable science that informs policy. We are not an ivory tower. We take our work into the environment and we make sure policymakers and politicians are aware of the implications of our work. And no one does that better in my experience than Milton has done. So it is my absolute pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, my friend and colleague, Dr. Walter Boyd. Wow, <laughs> it could be downhill from there. <laughs> so, I, mean, um, I trust you guys have, have, have looked at this. So let me um, let me move right along. Gosh. Um, um, 
buttons. Which one? Let's see where we are. Let me just press down. Technical. Ah, there we go. Yeah. So I put this slide in here just to let you know there's no way that I can cover all that's been learned in the last 50 years by the incredibly talented, diverse group of scientists that have been working in the Chesapeake Bay area. You know, institutions like John Hopkins here, Horn Point, BIMS. Uh, there's just a lot that's been learned. So most of the stuff, I'm gonna leave it out. Um, and so I'm going to aggravate some people because of that. And I'll make a few of you happy because I'm talking about something that you like or understand. And I need to do all this in 40 minutes or less, so hang on. Here we go. But this is the major points. One of the first guys I met at the lab was a fellow named Bob Biggs, and he said, when you give him a talk, you should tell him what you're going to tell him, and then tell him again at the end of the talk. So I'm telling him, first talk. Um, change is a common thing in the Bay, even though I've been here 50 years or so, um, lots of changes occur, and over longer periods of time. I'm going to show you a bit of Bay history, some big science and political battles and how they were resolved or not resolved. And I'm going to tell you several stories of loss and how environmental science helped to unravel some of these mysteries. And I'm going to talk just a little bit about climate change and what we do next. This is one of my favorite paintings of the day, um, 1588. Um, and the message here is, is several fold. One is, the bay is just so shallow. The average depth of the bay is about twice the, the height of this room. Just to put that in a little context, the average depth of the world ocean is 13,000 feet. We're talking 28, big difference. So this is a, a really, really different ecosystem. And the second thing that this painting makes just really, really clear is that the artist in 1588 drew the bottom of the bay. And I know that Jacques Cousteau and Scooby Gale was not available to this guy. So he, he painted it because he could see it. It was crystal clear. Um, I sometimes say, the water must have been gin clear. So we've got an ecosystem that much of the action took place on the bottom. And you're all familiar with the bountiful oysters that were in the bay. And, and they, were, they were not alone. Lots of organisms, both plants and animals, were on the bottom of the bay. And that, in my opinion, was most of the action. So a couple of other historical things. The John Smith diet. They, were not adapted to this environment when they first showed up here. Uh, they traded with natives for all kinds of, of food because they were not capable of doing it themselves. Um, and they traded swords for turkeys. And that did not work out very well for the English settlers. It was decades before um, reproduction in the colonies balanced mortality. They actually stayed here because they shipped more and more people from Europe to the colony. That's the way they survive. Then the other one's my favorite. Being an ex-smoker, I really like this one. It says it purges the superfluous phlegm and other gross humors and open it all the pores and passages of the body. And that was written by a guy named Harry, who died of a nasal tumor in 1621. So to some extent, the tobacco wars are still with us. If we were to jump back 30 years and I was giving this seminar back then, there would be lots of smoking going on in this room. And that just doesn't happen anymore. Another change um, in the way that we live in the Bay Area. I like this one. Um, there was a fellow named Hungerford. There's a creek just up the river called Hungerford Creek. Um, named there. He was a lawyer in Baltimore. He owned a plantation in Southern Maryland. Um, he was a, a rabid abolitionist. Um, and he lived on the plantation during 1832 because there was a cholera epidemic in Baltimore. He could get out of town, he was a wealthy man. He moved down to the plantation, lived there, and um, he wrote a book called Life on the Plantation. It was published in 1859. Anybody here have insomnia? <laughs> All right, get this book, it'll put you down. It'll actually put me down. But there were a couple of wonderful lines in this book, and this is one of them. Um, and it tells us something about what this river was like back then. So transparent are its waters that far off from shore you may see in the openings of the seaweed forest. These are the seagrass communities that we talk about so much. On its bottom, the flashing sides of the finny tribe as they glide over the pearly sands. So this is a guy, um, some people have told me, one of them sitting right over there, that this guy was probably looking down at about 20 feet of water. 
So again, in 1830, we've got some crisp, pretty crystal clear water. This is a view of the Patuxent River Basin. So this is the roughly 1,000 square miles that drains into this estuary. And when I first saw this slide, uh, the 1850 uh, panel, I thought, okay, yeah, sure, that makes sense. Yellow is forest. I was wrong. I'm, I'm used to being wrong. I'm an ecologist. <laughs> well, I'm wrong. Anyway, I was wrong on that one. That's ag land, either active or fallow. But um, in 1850, most of the trees in this thousand square mile basin, they were gone. They had been cut. Um, I later learned that that was true for most of the East Coast of the United States. And the thing we saw because of this kind of land use was we saw the filling of some of these estuaries. Uh, so places that were seaports for transatlantic trading silted, and they're no longer, of course, um, they can't get them. The first lottery in the state of Maryland, we talk about gambling, um, was for trying to dredge um, uh, the, the creek that goes up to Upper Marlboro. That was originally open for transatlantic uh, transportation and shipping. They were going to dredge it. The lottery failed. A whole bunch of people lost a lot of money. And um, you still can't take a big boat up uh, that particular creek. So growback occurred over the next 150 years. Forest hit a peak in around the late 1980s and census decline because urban and, uh, uh, and suburban areas have increased. Ag land and forest land have started to decrease. I want to mention, this is combined... <laughs> A condensed history, according to Walter. Some of this could be dead wrong, so you're welcome to be critical. But this is a way to try to condense this 50 years or more. So in the 1950s and 60s, scientists thought that pollution was not possible in estuaries because they were flushed repeatedly by, by relatively clean ocean water. Not to worry, people. The 1960s in this area, there is nothing, and we mean nothing wrong with the Chesapeake Bay. The reports of pollution are false and unpatriotic. You need to be fired for that sort of loose talk. And a number of faculty members at CBL came close to being fired because they were finding more and more evidence that there was a water quality and a habitat problem emerging in the Bay. This gets more interesting. In the 60s and 70s, the idea, this was supported by our Maryland Department of Natural Resources, that the more nutrients we can pour into the Bay, the better. Farmers know that fertilization is good, so let's get on with fertilizing the bay. That was the policy. In the 70s and 80s, we sort of threw up our hands and say, okay, okay, asteroids can be polluted, big deal. The only thing needed for restoration is control of phosphorus, and we know how to do that. In the 80s and 90s, it became clear that both nitrogen and phosphorus were killing bay habitats. The bay was, and this is a term I like, nutrient obese. Too much of a good thing. It's like humans eating too much food. Too much of a good thing caused problems. Uh, it's killing bay habitats, and we need a nutrient diet big time. And finally, restoration is hard. However, fears that all the aspects of the bay have long memories has proven to be reasonably false. Uh, the bay tends to be very responsive. However, the pathways of restoration are often not simple. In fact, they confuse people like me occasionally, or almost always. At the time of the truth. Um, but, but the responses tend to be pretty quick, which is a, a heartening thing. People <laughs> also change. <laughs> this is yours truly. I was going to show you a whole bunch of pictures of my colleagues from the 1960s. Then I thought, at this stage of my life, I don't need more enemies. You know, I, just, I just need to be reasonably happy. Anyway. <laughs> I was a summer student at CBL um, in the summer of 1969. I drove a chunk car from Boston to Calvert County, and the Prince Frederick almost turned around and went home. I thought, this is just too weird. And my main job, I thought, would be to be a great scientist, but actually, they hired me to run the Xerox machine. And so I spent the summer running the Xerox machine and dreams of exotic field work uh, for a while. But not all was lost because the very next summer, who should show up? But another summer student and uh, Mary Ellen. And um, we started dating on the pier. Um, and there were really three things that people did here uh, during the summers back then. Like we played a lot of volleyball. We did a lot of dating and crabbing on the pier. And we ate a lot of soft ice cream at the old pier restaurant that some of you might remember. 
Anyway, Mary Ellen and I are glad to report we're still dating. <laughs> That's been really great. So my point here is simply that not only has the landscape and the estuary changed, but so have people. Um, and it takes people to get some of this information put together. I'm going to run you through a, a little uh, graduate course called Nutrients 101. And what we're showing here in this slide is very, it's essential, it's important. Um, and that is, as, as any of you have a garden or anyone involved with agriculture knows, that if you put some nitrogen and phosphorus on the land, you're going to grow more flowers, you're going to grow more tomatoes and corn. So fertilization increases production. That happens both in aquatic systems and in terrestrial systems. Just as a point of interest, one of the old, old farmers in Calvary County, um, a guy named Starkey Wood, told me that um, when he was a little boy in Calvary County, corn production was around 30 to 40 bushels per acre. This was in the, the late 1930s. After the Second World War, into the 50s and early 60s, that jumped up to 80 bushels per acre. And now it's 150 to 180 bushels per acre. Part of the reason for that, not all of it, but part of it was fertilization. So fertilization is really important. It also aggravates me that many people in the press call nitrogen and phosphorus um, a pollutant. Okay, well, to a certain extent, I mean, to a very great extent, nitrogen and phosphorus is the stuff of life. Um, I, I was given a talk a while ago, and I said, I guess I got pretty involved with the talk. Um, I told people, I said, you know, if we didn't have nitrogen phosphorus, we'd be toast, meaning we wouldn't be there. And then I, th I thought, well, no, actually, we wouldn't even be toast because you need nitrogen and phosphorus to grow. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the essential thing. So I go back to the steam that's emerged over many years here, that this is, this is an essential compound that runs ecosystems. Um, what we have is too much of a good thing. And while restoration of the bay from this problem is not easy or simple, I think it's a heck of a better problem than, than having, having a, a, an estuary that's chock-a-block full of heavy metals or really long-lasting, very toxic organic compounds. We have the stuff of life. We need a diet. So I think that's a doable thing. So too much of a good thing has negative effects. And I've listed them here on the bottom. Um, and many of you are real familiar with their blown blooms, algal blooms, harmful algal blooms, and odors. And dead zones can be created by too much nut nutrient addition. Decreased water clarity is typical. Seagrass losses is occurs around the world with um, uh, excessive nutrient addition. And the pathways to, to support the um, higher food webs also become complicated and sometimes pretty screwed up. Okay, so most of us think of science as being sort of a clean deal where we have lab coats on. Uh, it's not always that way. The second point I'll make is, well, many, many things are online nowadays. We can click a few buttons and boom, there's the data. There are also, and I can tell you this is true, file cases throughout the drainage basin that have got dust and rust and have incredibly valuable information on pieces of paper that have never been put in. People like Carolyn Keith and Kathy Wood and I have hunted down some of those. Um, and I'm going to show you one where we reconstructed uh, the nutrient loads to the Patuxent River. And the reason I think this is important is for many years, I would ask people, well, how much do you think the loads of nitrogen going into or phosphorus going into the bay have increased, you know, since pre colonial times? And people would say, ah, oh, man, it must be 100 times or 1,000 times or 50 times or whatever. Do you really know? They said, no. No. <laughs> yeah, we're just guessing. So we started reconstructing some of this. And this is what we found for the Patuxent. That back in the John Smith time, now this was indirect reconstruction, by the way. John Smith was not measuring nutrients. He was looking at the <laughs> um, It looked like there was about 1,000 units of nitrogen getting into the estuary per day. By the 1960s, that's based on real measurements. It was around uh, 3,000 units. And in uh, the 2000s, it got up to around 7,000 kilograms per, per day. Um, and what the Bay program, what the diet is, is to move from the current conditions back towards um, the 1960s. Perhaps not all the way back there, but close to that. Uh, we know that many features of the Bay in the, in the early to mid 1960s were in very, very good shape, very productive. Uh, without some of the, uh, the 
the downside of nutrient obesity. So the three examples I'm going to talk about tonight um, of, of scientific progress uh, is has to do with nutrients. Where do they come from? And what nutrients should we control to improve water quality? That was a giant uh, discussion, uh, really global discussion, uh, with a lot of consequences that went on for quite some time. UMSEs and the Chesapeake community played a role in that discussion. Um, the second one was what happened to the seagrass, what the causes of the decline were, and where are we with restoration? And the final one was, what about the bottom of the bay? How important is this part of the ecosystem? Um, the answer to that one is real important. So where do the nutrients come from? Well, um, certainly from urban and suburban development, and, uh, this is the, the primary source of stormwater runoff. Uh, that's the only source of nitrogen and phosphorus to the bay that's currently increasing. And one of the reasons increasing is that we tend to pay for the watershed. Back in the early 70s, about 11% of the watershed was impervious in Maryland. Um, and that's increased in mid-2010 uh, to about 27%. So we need to get really much smarter with this impervious service business in Vermont. Treatment of waste at wastewater treatment plants. So that's a result of some of the urbanization and increased population. And I can tell you, that wastewater treatment engineers um, are doing some brilliant work. Um, the incoming nutrient concentration of, of nitrogen, for instance, at a storage treatment plant is around 50 or 60 milligrams per unit per, per liter. These engineers are now able to jack that down to about three milligrams per liter, 60 to three. And on occasion, um, I get a note from one of these guys that says, you know what, we're running at one. For a while. So there's been some amazing uh, uh, engineering that's been accomplished. And that, that source is going down. And each and every one of you, if you live in Maryland, is responsible for that because each and every one of us pays a little bit of money each month in what we call the flush tax. Most of us don't even know we're paying it. It's not, in my opinion, onerous, but it's the money stream that makes that possible. So that's, a, I think, a good thing. That was started in the Ehrlich administration and the O'Malley administration made it bigger and got it applied. Nitrogen also falls out of the sky. Um, atmospheric deposition is actually important. Um, however, the Clean Air Act provisions of that have kicked in and scrubbers are on some of these large electric uh, generating stations now that remove nitrogen and sulfur from the exhaust gases and atmospheric deposition has been cut more than in half, which is again, an amazing improvement. And finally, the diffuse sources. This is a big deal. This is the tough nut. I'm showing agriculture here. It's not the only diffuse source, but it's the biggest one. Um, and it's a tough one. Um, one of the things that is interesting to note is that, that a discussion of diffuse sources didn't start until somewhere between 68 and 72 in the Chesapeake Basin. Um, a writer, Tom Horton, um, if you haven't read his books, you really should read, read some of them, they're, they're quite great. Um, he took a look at, through his newspaper file um, collection, looking for the first serious discussions of non-point source pollution. And he came to the conclusion that it was somewhere between 68 in 72, that people started talking about it. And the first real big discussion of it was heavily criticized. And the criticism was that it's way overblown. Okay, then it turns out it's the biggest source. So things have changed and we continue to learn. So the nitrogen and phosphorus debate, the question is what to control. The backstory on this is that um, back at the beginning, that is in the 1960s, the idea um, that we knew some things. Now, and, and three were really important. One is that in lakes, people knew that phosphorus reduction for the temperate lakes, and many of them, would improve water quality. That was important. The second thing was they knew how to remove phosphorus from storage. So that was that was really, really important. And the third one is oops, third. I'll remember it when I go home tonight, but it was it were three reasons why phosphorus removal was, oh, I know, um, was that putting attention on nitrogen would be useless because these estuarine ecosystems would simply start fixing nitrogen with particular brands of algae that actually take nitrogen from the atmosphere and fix it. So that while you're spending money removing it, 
the, the organisms are actually fixed. So there, there is this, there were three, three fairly strong arguments. Um, so we started looking at them, and there were a few observations, not many, that suggested, you know what? Nitrogen may also play a role in estuaries. Estuaries may not work just like lakes. Um, they also may not work just like the open ocean, which people felt was probably limited by nitrogen. So um, we started to look at it. We started with a conceptual model that I'm showing you here to consider all of the possible factors causing algal blooms and estuaries, including physics, chemistry, and biology. And in this one, we're featuring nitrogen and phosphorus. So one, and we use three approaches. The first one was a comparative analysis. So what we mean by this is um, we asked, do we see algal blooms respond to nitrogen or phosphorus in other asteroids? Or do we just see scatter? What we found um, was a much stronger response to nitrogen than the phosphorus using data from 15 different estuaries. It's an early indication that nitrogen was also a big deal. It did not indicate that phosphorus was not a player. What it did indicate was Nitrogen was also a player. The second approach was what we call high realism mesocosm experiments. And these were big tanks um, that were filled with detoxic river water. So they were exposed to real sunlight, real temperature differences. There were real detoxic river organisms in these tanks. And we added nitrogen, phosphorus, and both, and said, well, what happened? And what happened was that in the winter, the algae responded to phosphorus, also in the early spring. It was a very large response, a huge response to ammonium in the summer and fall, and also a really huge response to nitrate additions. So there was some additional evidence here that both nitrogen and phosphorus were players in regulating algal growth in this giant, wonderful estuary. Um, however, we did these experiments. Uh, Chris Delia and, and Jimmy Sanders, two of the key players. Chris was a faculty member here at the time. Um, it was limited to one site. So I think critics would say, well, yeah, but you know, what about the rest of the bay? You did this in the production. Yeah, it was fairly interpretable, but it was one site. You know, and I don't think we're making big commitments based on that. So the third thing was small bottle bioassays. And I brought these bottles in here just to show you. There has been a hell of a lot of good science done <laughs> in estuaries and in other places using these little bottles, putting stuff in them and measuring what happens. Um, anyway, I just wanted you to see it. Um, we're not magicians. Um, we, we make some boring measurements and we do it again and again and again. And eventually we figure it out. This work was done by Tom Ford, a Fisher and his colleague. And for many years, at many sites in the Bay, um, they took, put bay water in bottles like this, checked it, nitrogen or phosphorus, both in the bottle, incubated it for a while, and then measured what happened. Did the algae grow or not? And then they took this rather large data set of observations and made this plot that I'm showing you here. And on the bottom axis, is the distance from the ocean. So at zero, we're down at the capes. At 200, Susquehanna Flats. Um, and you see the months of the year up and down the axis. And what Tom's work <laughs> and other work done more recently suggests is that nitrogen is a big player during the summer uh, and the fall. It's particularly a big player in the salty parts of the bay. Phosphorus is a good player uh, in some of the freshwater parts, particularly in the winter and spring. So, so now we have three levels of evidence suggesting that both of these nutrients are important. I'm happy to say the bay program adopted and has stayed with what we call a dual nutrient reduction strategy. That is, their goal is to reduce both nitrogen and phosphorus. I also want to remind us that um, if we don't stay on this, there's plenty of room for further degradation. <laughs> um, the bottom panel is uh, a beach city from some of our friends in China, um, where some of these coastal waters are really overloaded with nitrogen. And to make us not feel too good or um, a two prow. <clears throat> that green hand is from the upper Potomac River during a microcystis boom. And I do not recommend sticking your hand into a microcystis boom because the toxins are not good for people. They're not good for anything. Um, anyway, um, we need to stay focused on this. If, if we um, 
And I think Americans, and certainly this American, I have a short attention span. Um, and so we really need to remind ourselves, stay with it. Um, all right, seagrass is the second thing. We've got 13 species, perhaps more. They range from freshwater to marine. Um, the decline started before the 1940s. You may have read in the newspapers that, that tropical storm Agnes killed seagrass. Well, it did, but it wasn't the start of the decline. It was more like the nail of the coffin. Uh, originally, and this is about 1960, there were about 300,000, some estimates go as high as 400,000 acres of seagrass in the bay. That was decreased to around 38,000. So this was not a small decrease. In fact, Suzanne Bailey's in the audience tonight. She was one of the people that actually, that made measurements showing that this decline was starting in the bay system. Um, and I'm going to show you that, in fact. This is a picture, well, again, one of my favorite, maybe my second favorite picture. I got this from uh, Dr. Gene Cronin. Um, it was in his files, aerial photograph of Solomon's Island. Um, back then, there was one building on the lab grounds, and this dark area around the edge, that's eelgrass. Um, it was incredibly abundant. The water was still gin clear. Um, and these seagrasses changed species, but they went all the way up past Benedict. Um, up at Benedict, they were growing in 15 feet of water. Right? We know that from direct measurements. Um, and so um, this is, this is um, incredible. This is 1933, May. By 1963, the basin had started developing the first of the sewage treatment plants that are open. Um, Chalk Point was, was uh, generating power, and the bed started breaking up. This is a typical way that these seagrass communities go away. They start breaking into little pieces. Uh, by 1970, when I arrived here, they were gone. In the Potomac, um, in the early 1900s, seagrass has covered the entire shoreline of the Potomac, uh, all of the shallow waters except the main channel. Um, and by 1940, though, they were gone, probably as a result of nutrient enrichment from the growth of Washington, D.C., and, and no real treatment at all. Seagrass is now returning to some of those creeks. This is Suzanne stuff. Um, there was a sharp decline in the upper bay in the 1960s. There was also an outbreak of exotic um, seagrass plants. And since the mid 1990s, there's been a modest recovery. This is a huge habitat change. Um, um, in, in environmental science, which is really what we do, um, there's often multiple hypotheses, fancy way of saying lots of ideas. Um, associated with environmental issues. Typically, uh, that's typically the case for water quality, habitat, and fishery problems. Um, Tom could read off a whole bunch of things about why the crabs are struggling now. Lots of ideas. Um, and in some cases, uh, finger pointing goes on and on. Basically, the finger pointing is, it's not me that's done it, something else, you know, not me. Um, and the job of science, the job that we do, is to try to sort this stuff out. Um, I'm showing you here a graphic um, that lists the seven main uh, ideas about the seagrass decline. And uh, all of these had serious supporters when we started this work. We, meaning the global we, people at VIMS as well as, as us. Um, I'll tell you just a little bit about one of them, the natural cycle. Um, some of the folks, particularly at EPA and from the ag community, I think they really hope that what we were seeing here with this decline was was a natural cycle, and that the seagrasses would come back. That seemed unlikely because there were 13 different species that all went into decline, and that just doesn't make biological sense. The other thing was that a paleoecologist at, at Johns Hopkins, uh, a woman named um, uh, Grace Brush, um, started making core measurements in bay sediments here, there, and everywhere. And, and when they look at these cores, the farther down they go, is the farther back in time they go. And they were looking at pollen grains. And what Grace found, in fact, she called me up one day and she says, Well, to tell me that the seagrasses disappeared in 1970. I said, Yeah, they were gone by 1970. And Grace said, Well, our, our analysis of the court said that various species were here without interruption, no cycles, without interruption for the previous 1200 years, <laughs> probably longer, but that's where the core ended. Um, she found similar things in different parts of the bay. So the natural cycle hypothesis sort of went by the board. 
there were three that we could not just discard by looking at available data, and that was herbicides did, turbidity of the water column did it, and excessive nutrients interacting in other ways did it. So let me show you how we went about looking at that. Again, these guys, they were important. We did four different levels of study. Um, the first one in the upper left here are these bottle studies where we took little pieces of seagrasses and put them in bottles and injected nitrogen or phosphorus or herbicides and looked at what, what happened, uh, you know, what concentrations were important. It was a survey approach. Um, and the great part of it is they were inexpensive. They were pretty cheap to run. Um, you could do lots of them. Uh, and they were pretty fast. So it gave you an idea of what concentrations might be important. The second stage was to do experiments in mesocons, big ones like in the top right, um, where we had real sediments, real plants growing, some animals in there. So the reality, the realism of this was much greater. And the third level was that we got people to dig eight quarter acre ponds. So now, now we've got some real realism. Um, one of the problems we had with this real reason, with realism was that at one point early in this study, the black ducks of the Chop Tank River said, man, there's some great seagrass in there, and we can go eat them. You know? And so we're chasing ducks around. You know? That's what we're supposed to be scientists and lab coats, you know? I mean, anyway, one of the guys actually got a lot of the ducks to walk into a state van by putting corn down on the truck. And he had a couple of hundred ducks in this big van and he drove them away. <laughs> um, so what we found from all of this stuff um, was that um, we could not find herbicide concentrations in the bay that were anywhere near the concentrations needed to impact seagrasses in any meaningful mm -hmm. way. So we gave up on that hypothesis. Just could not find um, the the um, concentrations necessary. And, and we and others look pretty hard for it. You know, looking at different herbicides, different times of the year, even in small ag drainage ditches, we had trouble finding uh, concentrations that were significant. Um, but we did not have trouble um, showing that water column turbidity, because of increased algal abundance in the water column, shaded some of the seagrasses. And, the second way that seagrasses were hammered was shown in this diagram. And that is these little organisms, plants and animals, we call them epiphytes, they grow on surfaces, um, were growing at extraordinary rates on the surfaces of the seagrass leaves. Um, this happens in water that is nutrient enriched. Um, for these epiphytes, in these nutrient enriched waters, every day is like our equivalent to Thanksgiving dinner. In other words, they really grow fast. The seagrasses were in a deadly race to put out new fresh tissue that wasn't found um, to get the light. Um, in this particular experimental results here, um, these eelgrass leaves were exposed for 10 days. At the beginning of the experiment, the leaves were seeing 100% of the light. 10 days later, they saw zero. Um, it was probably actually zero after about seven days. Um, this kind of effect, water column turbidity, amplifies largely called the seagrass decline. But there is recovery. I'm showing you this slide here, beautiful slide actually, mm -hmm. of uh, the Chesapeake. And the part that I want you to focus on is this part up here, that's called Susquehanna Flats. It's an extensively flat, a shallow area of the bay, right at the mouth of the Susquehanna River. Um, a student uh, working with Mike Kemp, um, Cassie Gravis did this work. And, and there are all these little panels, one for each year starting in 1984 and uh, going forward. And you see that the Susquehanna Flats area shows this little tiny um, uh, indication that yeah, there were some seagrasses here, but you almost had to go hunt to find a seagrass spring. Uh, and that continued for many years. And then nature decided to do an experiment. In fact, the experiment nature did was what the Bay program was trying to do. That is, seriously decreased the nutrient input to the bay. And we had a drug that started in 1999, continued in 2000, 2001, and 2002. And the seagrasses started responding right away. There was no decade long lag. They started responding 
to this decreased mode of nutrient at stress really very quickly. Now, the story gets even more interesting. In 2003 and 2004, we had above normal flow. So more nutrient and phosphorus coming into the bank. So it, it is apparent um, that the seagrasses were showing some resiliency. In other words, they had got strong enough in the roots and rhizomes to actually get through some bad times. And they continue to expand uh, in this diagram through 2011. So this is a huge seagrass bed. Um, it's 20 square miles, 13,000 acres. The water's clear, there's signs of resiliency, so this is all good news. And um, we often think of biology being the tail of the dog. Well, occasionally the biology, the tail of the dog wags the dog, okay? And what people like Cassie have found is that this bed was so metabolically active and it actually modified the contents of the water coming out of the Susquehanna River. That is what we're really looking for. It's that kind of positive feedback. So back to the famous Chesapeake Bay uh, painting. Um, this is the third example. Uh, and we work to understand the role of sediments in the bay, the bottom of the bay. How important is it? I'm showing you this picture here. This is fairly geeky. Um, Tom uses the word. Pointy-headed, yeah, okay, this is pointy-headed. But the point is that in the 50s and this, uh, up through the 70s, there was no indication that there was a bottom in these mathematical models. <laughs> and one of the key issues was they didn't work. Okay, they didn't work in these shallow systems because the bottom is really important. Um, and, and, and by the time we got to the 1980s, um, sediment process were added um, and that, and, and and models started to improve. So how do we do this? Well, we use a boat. Uh, we have a wonderful boat here. Uh, we have an even better crew of scientists and technicians that work on these boats and do these things. We set up a laboratory in the boat to uh, make these measurements. Uh, and this is what these samples look like. Um, deep water cores are generally anoxic during the summer, meaning no oxygen at all. And the shallow water cores are oxic. That means they have oxygen. Um, the shallow water cores in more detail here um, are generally brown. Um, that's because the iron in our sediments, we have iron rich sediments, uh, is oxidized. It's called rust. That's the technical term. <laughs> rust. <laughs> and with rusty sediments, um, the others are iron, iron rich sediments where the iron has been reduced. Um, and that's, that creates uh, dark to, uh, black sediments. So what do we see? What do the sediments actually do? And how important are some of the factors regulated? So what I'm showing you here is a plot uh, that's got monthly data in it. And it's, it, the plot is uh, uh, the amount of phosphorus relative to the oxygen in the water. That's a real key feature in regulating what the bottom does. We see in April when there's a lot of oxygen in the bottom, Phosphorus releases are very low. Phosphorus concentrations are low. As we progress into the early summer, oxygen, the dead zones start to appear. Phosphorus suddenly starts to increase. Then it really increases as oxygen gets really low, and that continues into August. So this is the kind of stuff, this is the feedback that keeps the blooms going through the summertime. After nutrients come in from the rivers, they get used, and then they get reused. Our, our back of the envelope, that's one of my favorite things. Back of the envelope calculations indicate that a nitrate molecule that comes in the bay from the Susquehanna River gets used and reused about six or seven times before it goes to sleep in the late autumn of the year. So lots of activity. We also looked at this for uh, ammonium, one of the major nitrogen forms. And we see a pattern through the summer that's very similar with one exception. And that is not all sites at low oxygen continue to have big releases. It's a suggestion that the sediments are actually running out of gas, that the memory of nutrient abuse is not long. It's probably measured seasons or a couple of years. Another thing we did to try to substantiate some of this stuff was to, again, go back to this comparative analysis and, and, and think along the lines of, Nitrogen inputs to the bay get algal blooms. The algal blooms sink to the bottom. They're remineralized. Ammonium comes back out of the, the, the bottom. 
And what we see here is this upward slant that says, yeah, you put more nitrogen in, the sediment's going to release more. Um, and what we also saw in a measure of experiments at the University of Rhode Island, these are far more controlled, but still fairly realistic. We see the same response. If you dump more nitrogen in, you get this feedback going right away. And finally, in the back river, which is a small tributary of the bay up near Baltimore, um, when, when we have major load reductions, and this is from serious reductions in nitrogen and phosphorus coming from sewage treatment plants, we see this almost instantaneous reduction in the amount of nitrogen coming out of sediment. What that really means is that the summer conditions will start to improve. So this is an important feedback. This is one of the things we found by looking at these sediments. Okay, the future, we're almost done. Only a couple of people have passed out. That's good. Um, <laughs> um, there are many changes. I, I told you about some of them. One of them is the sad loss of Senator Burley for Bernie Fowler. This building is named after him. He's a lifelong advocate for a healthy bay and a healthy protection river. He was a terrific guy. He worked with many of us at this lab. Um, he, was, um, he was also an incredible general. Um, and making current and future bay restoration more difficult and complex there is climate change, and this climate change effects are, are not out in the future. They're with us right now. Um, the billboard out where you enter the campus, it's got these wonderful um, um, show of how water temperature has changed over the decades here at Sea Level. Very convinced. Um, so temperature is going up in the bay. Um, we've learned that these systems can have high levels of variability. River flow is just one of them. This is the Potomac River, same place during the drought and during the flood, we think that we'll see more strong climate variability as climate change progresses. Um, sea level rise is going up, not just in the Bay, but around the world. Um, a while ago, um, we were asked to write a paper about challenges and directions for estuarine science in the decades to come. And, and, and these are the, as I call them, the lovable rogues who worked together to put this together, led by Michael Kemp, who sadly passed away just a few years ago. Um, anyway, um, it was a wonderful piece of work and we really uh, worked hard at this. So I'm gonna end this talk with the challenges and the directions. So what are the challenges? Well, we think we need to really work hard to maintain and improve our monitoring. If we let go of these monitoring programs, we are toast. Um, we will go back to where we were in the late 1960s, and that is anybody's opinion was as good as anyone else's. These monitoring studies that have been going on consistently, they're incredibly boring, um, but they are also the gold standard. We need to um, innovate, use new technologies, um, satellite observation, drones. Um, when Dave Seco was talking about sturgeon, those tags, all of this stuff is new, it's affordable, and it's really useful. We need to re-emphasize the use of experimental ecosystems. Um, these are these measure costs that I showed you a couple of examples of. They are a way to test ideas reasonably realistically and reasonably quickly. They are a good use of our resources. We need to better couple with ecological models. These are the mathematical models. A really pointy-headed people work on these. Um, and we really need those because uh, what, what happens is the models put our data to the test. They, they tell us whether we have a good or a poor understanding of, of what we're working on. Um, they also can be used to forecast, but I think their basic really primary use for people like me is that they tell us where we're really lacking in understanding, which suggests what we ought to do. That will improve. And finally, um, we, ought to, we can improve basic science by linking it to apply research. And this nitrogen and phosphorus debate that went on for a long time is such a great example of doing exactly that. The fisheries people do that naturally. That's part of their tradition. We need to make it uh, more of a tradition. And finally, the research questions. Um, so here we go. How do food webs respond to changing climate and nutrients? Right now, we tend to manage the bay with um, at least in terms of habitat and water quality by saying, this is, we need this amount of oxygen in the water. And that's useful, I'm not putting it down, but I think it would be even more useful if we said this level of nitrogen and phosphorus dosing maximizes 
the secondary production of fish and shellfish and, and crabs and so forth and so on. We, 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 there's an opportunity to become more sophisticated and useful. Um, we need to, to get better at uh, understanding the trajectories of, of ecosystem recovery. The management people really, really need to know that because they need to manage public and political expectations. So when some systems go like this, they need to know where the this is. Other systems, when they're restoring, might be going like this and they're taking a lot of heat, boom, and all of a sudden they get better. They need to know about those things. We need to know how climate alters seasonality of ecosystem processes. Um, might crabs be swimming around all year? Hmm, interesting. Um, might the spring bloom of diatoms start not in the spring, but in the winter? Um, so seasonality is important, and we need to learn more about that. I didn't talk about this, but estuaries affect the global carbon budget, um, and one of the key feedbacks associated with that. Estuaries bury carbon in the 70s, and that could be important. Uh, the level of importance, I think, remains um, pretty unknown, but, but people are working on it. And finally, how will tidal wetland ecosystems respond to sea level rise? Right now, they act like a kidney between the land and the water. They really tie up nitrogen, phosphorus, and dirt really nicely. As sea level starts rising, or uh, is rising, they start eroding. So this nutrient sink starts to become a nutrient source. So we need to be concerned about the, um, how these wetlands respond to sea level rise. So the take home messages, obviously, any of you who know me know that my crystal ball is far from perfect. There may be some wrong headed ideas here, so remain critical. Um, that's a good thing. Um, bay water could do, and habitat could be better or worse. There's room for both. The basic model calling for large NP load reductions, the dual nutrient strategy, I think is sound um, and it needs to be pursued. When we start decreasing the load of NMP, what we start to see is the expected outcomes. That's good news. That's great news. Um, these systems are complex. There are feedbacks, lags, and I only mentioned a few. They are bound. So we need to be prepared for some surprises, both good and bad surprises. There could be some really good surprises. And water quality and habitat response times vary, but they tend to be faster than previously expected. Um, a cleaner bay in some of our lifetimes seems to be very possible. I've told more than one audience that in the past, I thought of the bay as sort of a lumbering brontosaurus. In other words, very smooth. Just, you know, you pushed on it, nothing happened. I was wrong. The bay is much more like a greyhound. I mean, it's boom. So um, the responses can be quick. So I think we can expect, if we do the right things, some responses that will be particularly useful and heartening. So that's my story, I'm done. I'm sticking with this story until I hear a better story. <laughs> well, that's humorous. That is the way science works. Uh, when we hear a better story, we go on to it. <laughs> sure. Okay, so the way we've worked in the past with this is we've asked a question from the audience and a question from the chat room. So we'll start with a question from the audience. Excuse me, I've got a foot that doesn't get me up too quick. Um, so you talk about nitrogen as in all nitrogen is the same. I mean, to me, nitrogen is N2, but it's also N4 and a whole lot of other. Is there a difference in where the nitrogen comes, the compounds that yeah. come from? Absolutely. Um, there are there are a number of important forms: ammonium, nitrate, nitrite, what we call dissolved organic nitrogen, and particular organic nitrogen, and N2 from the atmosphere. Um, the, the nitrogen forms that really um, um, fire the bay up are ammonium and nitrate. Those are the real important um, uh, fertilizing nutrients. There's a lot of research going on, or has gone on, with dissolved organic nitrogen, thinking that that is also a big source, but it has to be remineralized more before it becomes effective as a, a plant stimulant. So yes, a big difference. 
All right, so one from the chat room. For those who've attended all of these, it's not about blue catfish. We haven't had the blue catfish question yet. We'll get it, I'm sure. Um, have filter feeders such as oysters and menhaden been studied to show relationships to water quality improvements and then work with fisheries managers to show cause and effect? Yeah. Whew. There have been um, some, some serious discussions some um, better than back of the envelope calculations. Um, and um, they're, 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 the answer is when those animal abundances, particularly in the benthos, get high enough, they're certainly uh, within the realm of what we've seen in the past, they can have a hell of an impact on water quality and habitat. So, yes. Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with what the current standing is with Hennig. I know that some people at VIMS did some computations that said probably not a big impact. Um, I don't know if there's general agreement on that or not. Uh, it's kind of encouraging to see the story of the recovery, but what about the role of invasive species? Do you think they're going to be as responsive? Uh, to recovery as uh, yeah. nutrients? This is a really good question. Um, some of you who read the Washington Post or maybe the Baltimore Sun, what, 15 years ago, there was the hydrilla monster that was going to eat DC. You know, and, and, and some of us thought, great, good. <laughs> anyway, um, yes, uh, we, we've got a number of invasive species growing in the seagrass community. One of the heartening things that I did see was that. Um, seagrass communities in the upper Potomac River are resurging. They're doing pretty well. And the resurgence is really interesting is that it starts with the invasive species like hydrilla, which appear to be more resilient to pretty poor water quality. Um, the USGS people have sort of sorted some of that out and said the hydrilla makes the environment just a little bit better. If you get a period of time where river inputs are normal or a little below normal, the natives start. There. And as the community develops, the natives become dominant. That's the pattern, is um, that it's not always dominated by the exotics. So in some ways, Suzanne, it seems like the exotics kickstart the recovery. That's the message from some of the uh, SAB people working with USGS. They've done some beautiful work in the team. That's good. All right, we'll go back to the chat board. We'll, I'll take a comment, turn it into a question from a colleague of ours, Tom Fisher. Uh -oh. um, I think we also need to include more economics and social sciences in our research because most of the changes we need to reduce nutrient inputs to the bay requires the cooperation of people. Yes, I totally agree. Um, Changing behavior is incredibly difficult. One of the things that, that I do is uh, I'm on the, I'm a trustee with the Maryland DC Nature Conservancy. We become very active in Eastern Shore agriculture, best management practices, and all that kind of thing. And one of the things that and, and Tom Fisher has been really really active on the ground, putting in DMPs and seeing how they work. So this is terrific work. Um, I mean, it's the kind of thing that UMSEs should be. Doing a lot of it, even more of it. It's wonderful. Anyway, um, a, a lot of this business of, of, um, of people is that one of the things that, that we heard again and again of the TNC people working in the field is that when, when they suggest a BMP, um, how does it, how does it, why is it adopted or not adopted? And the, the, big, the big thing pushing it seems to be what my neighbors do. So, Farmers take advice from other farmers, and the farmers that initially started take advice from some of the some of the uh, engineering firms that produce their nutrient budgets and, and other technical parts. So this whole business, um, in fact, TNC is sharing now a position in our series that's dealing with uh, the social aspects of um, of ag and the adaptation of. Um, on best management practices. So I'm really, I'm all in favor of that. Tom's, I think, absolutely right. That's something we haven't done enough of. 
In fact, Matt Hauser, the yeah. man involved, will be speaking here tomorrow afternoon at 3.30. So if anyone wants to hear that, you're welcome. Uh, question from the audience. Anne. I have a layperson's question. This spring, we have these huge carpets of grass all over creeks, just kind of like floating hay. Is, what is that? You saw that this spring? Yeah. Yeah, that's called Xanachelia. It's a, a, a early spring seagrass. It, flower, it grows like crazy in May and June. Uh, then it um, um, senesces, it dies, and goes away. It's a good thing? I think it is. I think it's part of the normal seagrass cycle. I think from the point of view of, is it a great overwintering food for waterfowl? No, because it's not here in the region. Um, but um, I think it's part of the, of the seagrass cycle. Certainly ties up a lot of inorganic nitrogen, which otherwise would be like phytoplankton. So um, I know it can be a pain in the neck. Um, this spring, I was taking my little sailboat up St. John's Creek, no, Mill Creek. And I got part way up Mill Creek and I, it stopped. <laughs> and when I came back a few days later, it was gone. So yeah. Kind of the wonders of nature. There's one from the chat room, and this one is news to me. So comment on whether greater attention would be achieved by including the bay as a unit of the National Park Service as proposed by Maryland senators, whether that would increase water quality. Wow. Mm. I hadn't even heard that was proposed. So see in my I, ivory tower, I'm afraid. I come down every Tuesday night. <laughs> well, you know, right now, Bay is a super multiple use uh, environment. I mean, we we, are, we have important recreational activities, we have bird watching, sailing, boating, recreational fishing, the commercial fishing, and uh, <clears throat> it's a uh, a seaport of global interest. It's the biggest naval military base we have in the country. And so it has enormous number of uses. It, it also, um, the landscape is 14 times bigger than the surface area of the bay. So um, it's that's one of the reasons why it's it's sensitive to what we do. So you know, I'd have to think a lot about yeah. that before yeah. I have. Actually, people would say, well, you could have a lot of thinking about that, and you still don't have a worthwhile opinion. <laughs> anyway. All right. Uh, given the hour, I'm going to call it quits. Um, I know water will remain in the room to answer any questions that you have. Um, this being our last one, I want to thank you all for your attention. For those who've been with us for all five uh, Science for Communities lectures, we'll be back in the spring um, with something uh, equally special as these. If you like what you've heard, here comes the ask. Please feel free to help donate uh, to our students who are always welcoming of your support. Um, umcs.edu forward slash CBL will get you there. Um, thank you all for your attention, and please join me in thanking Walter one last time for just a great day.